Hey everybody, Josh RV Nerd here with Bish's RV with just some helpful information for you today. Whether you're thinking of buying from Bish's or not, what I want to do here is we want to give you that extra information and insight where like not just buying an RV and how much does an RV cost to purchase, but how much does it cost to own an RV? What are the other factors other than just the upfront price tag that maybe you haven't considered, especially handy here. This might be a great video today for first time RVers who are thinking of getting into the RV lifestyle. Not just what you might need to budget for a monthly payment, but what you might need to budget to get the RV working, to keep it working, all those other different things we're gonna dive into today. And if you appreciate handy little insight videos like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button, like our video. And uh, if you have extra insights as we go here from your experience, if you're an experienced RVer, please leave some comments, chime in, and uh, let me know if there's anything that maybe I've missed that somebody else might want to consider before they go, uh, you know, getting into the camping scene. For instance, one of the major things I think people forget about is they, they get so focused on buying the RV, they don't realize that there's a bunch of other stuff, pieces, parts, accessories. You really need to go with it to have a really... Um, effective and fun excursion. Some of the things maybe, you know, aren't required, but boy, I'd sure recommend them. Like uh, electric and water surge guards. Kind of like if you bought yourself a fancy, you know, TV or laptop or something like that, you'd probably plug, plug it into like a surge protecting power strip, right? Well, why not your RV that costs vastly thousands of dollars more than that laptop. Wouldn't you like to protect that with a surge protector? Uh, would you like to make sure the RV doesn't roll away from you down a hill if you're not paying attention? That's where wheel chocks can come in. But none of these things are necessarily required and none of these things are typically included with an RV. For instance, most RVs still do not come from the factory with any sort of battery or propane in them, maybe empty tanks. Um, that's all stuff that you kind of need to be aware of and consider. Not every dealership just takes care of those things for you, um, nor necessarily can every single widget and whiz -bang be included with part of a purchase because some people are brand new and they need the whole shebang. Some people, they're just going to camp a little bit here and there. They don't need all the widgets and whiz -bangs. Some people are going to go full-time RVing and they need everything and they need really heavy-duty versions of it. And some people are experienced RVers with trade-ins who've already got the majority of things and don't you know, need to spend the money. So that's why on the front side of things, you don't think about that because the dealership can't typically build that kind of stuff into their price tag. But um, as you're seeing from the little list that we populated over here, uh, depending on what you get, how much you need, and, and it does vary obviously by your RV. You're going to see that be a regular trend through this. The answer to all these questions today of how much this or that is, it varies, but I want to give you at least an idea, you know, something that you can use as a barometer. It could be anywhere from, I've seen people spend um, tens of dollars on a new RV getting just absolute basic bare necessities and then just saying, I'll just use some old wood blocks for levelers and chocks, which can do the job. Or I've seen people go whole hog with all of the things and spend a couple grand over here in our part shop. And that can happen very, very quickly. But that's something that a lot of first time RVers just don't think about. Now, I, I also, again, my goal with this is to be fair and not just to help drive business to our parts and service centers or sales shops. I'm trying to just do a service for you folks looking. So like pieces, parts, widgets, and whiz bangs, you can, generally speaking, you can get right from an RV dealership. You know, that's pretty, I think, common knowledge that makes sense. Different dealerships have different size service parts, apartments, different things are gonna be available. I mean, that kind of makes sense. But again, being fair, Nothing says you have to pick stuff up directly from an RV dealership. Uh, major online retailers, like I think, you know, Amazon is probably the very first one that sort of comes into mind. Um, almost anything and everything you can imagine is available there. The trick with that is some things are almost need to be fit and formed or, or chosen in relation to your RV. And if you're not sure exactly which thing you're getting, you may have to deal with like a return situation. Some things uh, can't always necessarily be returned to an online retailer or anything like that. So sometimes it can be really handy to have somebody locally say, like uh, like roof vents. You think roof vent covers are, are totally generic? They're not. Um, there's two or three different uh, variables that you have to look at to know which one marries up. And sometimes it really is handy having a person who just specializes all day in widgets and whiz bangs to help you uh, kind of guide you through that. It's actually, we don't call our people like parts salespeople or RV salespeople. We call them outfitters at Bish's RV because our goal is just to help you get geared up and outfitted with the things that best serve you and 
your camping needs. And as you may have noticed, at the time of this filming, it's a little bit brisk out here. It's uh, about 39 degrees, which once you're acclimated to that in Michigan, um, that's practically shorts weather, but I have no hair, so I'm wearing the handy little beanie hat. But that kind of leads me to, what about the cost of winterizing an RV? Because for many RVers, that could be an additional annual cost that you didn't really think about up front. Um, there's, uh, I'm gonna give you three different kind of breakdowns on this here. So first of all, let's say you wanna go to some service center or dealership or whatever to have your RV professionally winterized. Um, typically, Googling around or calling different places, I, I find that tends to run anywhere from about, say, you know, 80 bucks to like 150, 160. It really depends on the labor rate of the place and the quality of antifreeze they're using, which kind of leads me to the next one. If you decide to winterize it yourself, how much does antifreeze cost per gallon? Well, I've seen it anywhere from like four bucks a gallon to around 10 bucks a gallon. Um, and the, the thing there is not all antifreeze is created equally. First of all, you should only be using pink antifreeze in your RV's water lines because it's non-toxic. The green stuff, like I, I've seen if it, I've seen twice in my career, somebody brought a used RV to us to trade in and it had green antifreeze through the lines. That's an instant all stop. This is a deal breaker because your entire water system is now chemically dangerously contaminated. Green antifreeze in the lines, if like you're going to buy a used RV somewhere uh, from a dealership, from a private seller, whatever, you see green antifreeze, run, don't walk away from that thing because it might kill you. And I and I mean that for real. Um, the, uh, the thing there is the cheaper antifreeze is usually made with like animal fat, which will keep the water lines from freezing up, sure. But um, animal fat, it, it, it'll stink when it'll coat those water lines and even once you flush the antifreeze out that fatty stuff is kind of coated into the lines and it starts to rot and stink and a lot of times when people dewinterize their rv in the spring like good god it smells like roadkill up in here um it, well you know it's just that that's that's what happens the hardest part about that is it is not easy to determine if like what kind of rv v antifreeze has animal fat and uh or, or which ones don't like it's really tough by looking at the packaging because naturally i don't think they want you to know that kind of thing they just want you to go look we're pink and we're cheaper so the cool thing at least for bish's rv customers is we can take care of all that for you and we do so uh by by way of our diamond club membership benefits um everybody who purchases from bish's rv whether new or used which is one of the things i like um, we throw these like um, twice annual block party winterization kind of things where we literally just shut down the service department for anything but absolute critical work where like a client is like, if you don't get my RV fixed, like, you know, I've been living in it. I need this thing back. Um, we shut it down for everything but absolutely critical work uh, for two days each year. And if you're a vicious customer, you don't need an appointment. You literally just roll in, we pull you into a bay, we get you uh, winterized, and you roll it on your merry way all nice and done. Now, whether um, you know we do it for you, you have another dealership do it, whether you do it yourself, one of the other things that I want to kind of run past you here is the idea of a professional winterization being in a, in a way like one of the cheapest RV insurance policies you could imagine. And, and here's what I mean by that. Basically, if you do your own winterization and you screw it up, you're going to pay to fix it. Now, the most common things I see people miss, like they forget that um, when winterizing their RV, uh, if your RV has a washer and dryer unit, if you have an ice maker, that requires extra antifreeze, and those are very often extra appliances that people forget to run the antifreeze through basically also outside showers i can't tell you how many used rvs i've seen with cracked dripping leaky outside shower heads because nobody happened to think to run outside and run a little bit of antifreeze out through that because it, it's out of sight out of mind you know but those are now things that you're going to need to repair and replace or like uh your water heater the water tank that could i mean you know depending on how severe that bursts and what kind of water damage it causes that could be thousands and thousands of dollars. And um, that's not typically the kind of thing an insurance company will always cover depending on the cause that is determined. So what I'm getting at here is if you winterize it yourself, you're saving a couple bucks up front. 
hoping that you don't need to do any kind of repair work down the line. Now, there's no re I'm not trying to be a fear monger. There's no reason to think a properly done winterization by a private owner would ever be an issue. It should absolutely be a totally viable option. But if we screw something up during your winterization, we stand behind our work and we're going to pay to fix it. Now, I don't, I can't speak for every single dealership and every single group. I can't, uh, I, you know, I, I can't make that kind of statement. What I can tell you is like I said, if you do it and you screwed up, you're gonna have a repair bill. If we do it and we screwed up, we're gonna eat that repair bill. So hard shifting gears here. How much are things like RV taxes, title work, license plates, registration, state type stuff like that? And naturally it varies greatly but it's it varies based on the state in which the rv is registered which is something that throws a lot of people it is not unusual to have an rv registered in a different state than you live an rv doesn't necessarily have to be registered in your state of residency off your driver's license um, I do recommend that you contact your local DMV, or for some reason in Michigan we call it a Secretary of State, but it's the same thing. Um, the uh, uh, and get an idea. Say you know, okay, we're looking at buying a I don't know thirty thousand dollar travel trailer. What are the state fees, tax rates, things like that? Get an idea of that locally, because one of the interesting things is some states uh, do a thing called reciprocation, where like um, you pay part of your taxes at the time. Uh, uh, that you purchase your RV, but when you go home and register it, you may have to pay the rest of your taxes. Now that might be because two different states have two different state tax rates, or you may have a county and or local tax that a state to state transaction does not yet account for until you go to get it registered. So there's some weird things like there that can take place. Um, sometimes the RV may be registered uh, in the state uh, uh, where your dealership is located um, if they do the financing for you. Now, that basically what will happen in that case, if there's two different tax situations working out, typically uh, most dealerships will work out the one that is the lowest upfront cost. But that's part of the reason I want to put this video together. The lowest upfront cost doesn't mean the lowest total cost. You may still need, when you go home to get, if, if, you're, if your dealership doesn't do all of the license work for you and just mail you the license plate, if you have to go to your own DMV and register your RV and get your own license plate, you're probably going to have a, a fee to do that and you may again have some residual uh, remaining taxes uh, in, in the balance that you need to cover. Now, when I say reciprocating, for those who are not familiar with that, because I wasn't until I worked in this, let's say, uh, I'm just because I'm here, I'm just gonna use this reference, it's the one I'm most familiar with. Michigan has a 6% tax rate. Indiana has a 7% tax rate and often a county and or local tax. So if you have an RV registered in Indiana, but you purchase from a Michigan dealership, we will collect 6% of your total taxes up front and we forward that to the state of Indiana. It's prepaid. You don't have to pay taxes twice uh, in a situation like that. You only pay the little balance or remainder when you get there. Where this gets a little bit weird is there are a couple states that I have seen um, their DMVs really muscle people. And uh, and I, I'm sorry, that sounds like the DMV staff members are just being bullies. That's not what I meant to say. I, what I mean is the state policies that the local DMV people are, their job, you know, they're required to enforce can, can sometimes like, if you buy something outside of the state of California, you wanna bring it in often, the state of California will make you pay their taxes. They don't care, they're a honey badger, they don't care. It depends on the situation, of course, but keep in mind, I, I recommend you investigate your own local, state, county, local tax, things like that. And, uh, you know, at least then you have uh, an, an idea of what, again, your total cost of ownership might be. That's the goal of this video today. So what about license plates? Once again, that will vary based on the state in which your RV is registered. Um, and many states, have, well, every state has just almost completely different ways that their uh, RV license plates are calculated. Uh, Michigan, for instance, has different rules for towable versus motorized. So like in Michigan, um, the, the most you can pay possibly for a trailer license plate 
is $300 once. Not annually, but a one-time $300 fee. But most travel trailers and fifth wheels uh, in Michigan um, are registered under a $200 lifetime plate. It doesn't transfer anything like that. But motorized RVs, as soon as you put a motor into it, it changes based on the value of the RV and is typically a annual renewable thing. Um, now, uh, like say, again, I'm not trying to beat up on them, but Indiana is my next door neighbor. It's the one I'm most familiar with. So it's the one off the tip of my tongue. All of their RVs, total motorized anything, your license plate, you're going to pay annually based on the, uh, the value, the, the original purchase value of that RV. So if that RV is 10 years old, you're paying the exact same license plate fee 10 years later every single year. So it can vary wildly from state to state or even by type of RV, towable or motorized. Again, investigating that prior is a really, really good idea. Um, because the thing is, all of these different like state fees and other hidden things I call junk fees are not things that uh, every RV dealership is always quite so upfront about. It's actually one of the things I really like about working here at Bish's RV. From the very top leadership of this company down, they encourage me to put this kind of information out there. We have a team of uh, staff writers, blog writers, who do very similar things. They've actually covered a topic very similar to this previously. You know what, if I remember, I'll leave a link for that in the video description. If I forget, if you'd like to kind of see maybe a hard copy, look at what I'm talking about. Uh, if I forget, leave me a note and I'll drop that in the description. Anyway, what I'm getting at here is um, I, I know that this video is supposed to be based on, you know, after the sale stuff, but this is one of those topics that it's just such a thing I have to get on my soapbox on. There's a lot of dealerships that will advertise this unbelievable, too good to be true price. The one thing most of us know about things that are too good to be true, they typically are. There's a, uh, a really rampant practice in the RV industry that is uh, generally referred to as junk fees. So they'll say, yes, this is our price plus this fee, plus this fee, plus your go ready camping fee, plus this fee. And that is how, if you read these stories, sometimes people purchase an RV that was like $18,000 that they, they thought was $18,000. Um, and by the time that they're all done and they're run through the finance office and all the smoke screen is done, they find out they have a balance to finance like they actually owe $31,147.37 on this thing. And they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. That was an $18,000 RV. Um, the, the recommendation I have here for someone who's considering shopping, you wanna know what is my total cost of ownership, even on the front side of the purchase side of this, make sure you find out what is the total out the door cost of this RV. If I put, uh, if I walked in with one check left in my checkbook and I was gonna write one number in that and if I screwed it up because you gave me the wrong number, I can't buy this, what does that one number have to be? That is how you can smoke all that crap out. Even if you end up financing later, you ask them if I had one check left in my checkbook, what does the number on that have to be for me to buy this RV outright today? And that is how you can determine the, uh, the best total purchase price on the front side of your purchase right there because it, it completely eliminates and defeats all those hidden fee nonsense things. And if a place won't give you that number, I would ask yourself why and I would I personally wouldn't do business at an establishment that won't tell me how much something costs before I buy it. Now that's just me. You purchase according to your own you know, thoughts, wants, and peace of mind. And as long as we're on this, do not let yourself get bullied uh, by a finance officer who's ba who, who could be doing their job literally illegally. And, and for those who have never gone through the RV financing purchase process, here's what I mean on that regard. Um, when you finance an RV, typically you have options. There are extended service contracts. People call them extended warranties, but when you pay for it after the RV, it's technically an extended service contract. Technically a different thing. I get that I'm splitting hairs, but so that you know the, the verbiage and the nomenclature, because technically, legally, that matters. Um, uh, there's extended service contracts. There's like tire and wheel protection. There's exterior coatings to keep uh, you know your RV looking good from sun exposure long term. There's a lot of different things you have the option of adding to your RV after it's actually already been approved for finance. But you are never, never required to add those things to your RV's financing. And and this is a major deal here. This is a legal deal. If somebody from a dealership even insinuates that a bank would not complete your lending unless you added these many thousands of dollars of extra things onto your RV financing contract, that 
is an illegal, clear-cut uh, violation of truth in lending laws in these United States. So keep that information in mind. That is one of those things. I, I don't care if you're if you're all the way at the eleventh hour and you drove from eight hours. If someone's doing that, they are lying to you. And if they're willing to lie to you right there about your money to your face, imagine what else they're willing to lie about. Somebody else has an RV that you can purchase. Somebody else has a good price on an RV. None of these things are unique. None of them are uh, a, a one of a kind kind of situation. Do not let yourself get bullied. And if they start saying con man stuff to you, like, like boy. I'd really hate to see what happens to your salesperson after all this time and effort was spent and you don't buy it. That's that's how they're going to conduct themselves and treat their staff members by threatening their staff members in front of you if you don't buy it or else that person gets in trouble. I don't know about you. That's just not how I I I, I conduct myself. Now I, I didn't mean to go down this, this side path over here, but it is obviously something I feel very passionate about. You can see I get fired up about it a little bit because for 14 years of my life at the time I'm recording this, I've dealt against this kind of just flat lies and it, it burns me up. And if I can help one person avoid going down that road, then, I, then this video today I think would have been worth it. So back to the, you know, after the sale, how much does this continue to cost me kind of stuff? What about RV insurance? Every single day. I'm, to be fair, I am in a lot of RV social media groups like Facebook groups and stuff, but every single day I see the question, how much is RV insurance? And again, it varies because what people don't realize is insurance guidelines can vary from state to state. It's not even from company to company. State Farm in one state might be different from State Farm in another state because of what's required in that state or what they allow or don't allow. And it can vary all over the place. But I wanna try to give you some sort of barometer reference. So these are some loose, rough, annual premium costs by RV type that we were able to locate. And understand, that is a guide not a Bible, but if you've never done this and you're trying to figure out what is my annual budget, like can we buy the RV up front, can we afford the monthly payment, but then can we afford to insure it? I wanna answer those questions. But also, not only that, can you afford the fuel for that thing? Let's look at that. Now, I, I think it goes without saying that you understand how uh, fuel rates, you know, cost per gallon varies uh, hourly, day to day. So, you know, y you can look at a motorized RV's fuel tank uh, capacity, multiply by the current going miles per gallon, and that can at least give you an idea of how much it takes to fill up. But how long can you go on that fuel tank? Well, again, this can vary wildly by a bunch of different factors, but to give you some rough uh, barometer figures, for motorized RVs, class A, B, and C, here are some rough guideline estimated miles per gallon values that you might uh, expect to see. Now, again, if you're gonna be flat landing uh, on, you know, in, in really mild terrain, you might see a higher number. If you're going up and down hills and mountains, if you have wicked crosswinds, if you have nasty headwinds, if you're towing something behind a motor home, that will all drag down. Or if you are like Johnny Full Send It and you're just like, pedal to the pedal, baby. Well, that's, that's gonna naturally eat into your miles per gallon that you might expect. Also, um, especially once you start getting above 60 miles an hour, your, um, your miles per gallon just really starts tanking very, very quickly. So if you're looking at a more towable kind of segment, that's a little bit trickier because not, uh, there's not a whole lot of data out there that says here's estimated miles per gallon while towing. What I can tell you is that often when you're towing something, your miles per gallon will, will drop to one half down to one third of what your unladen miles per gallon may be. So to give you an idea, let's say you've got a pickup that gets about 22 miles a gallon, you slap a trailer behind it, it could be anywhere from like eight to 14 miles a gallon, uh, real world, once you're actually pulling it down the road. And the interesting part about that is 
even if you put just a tiny little pop-up camper or you're like well my truck's rated for 12,000 pounds and i just have a 3,000 pound little guy i don't need a big fancy camper to behind me you will still see a significant reduction in your miles per gallon because you're breaking the wind signature that those automotive manufacturers have taken a lot of time, effort, and money engineering to try to get their miles per gallon ratings higher because there's some federal regulations requiring that they need to do that as best as they can, basically. Um, so as a result, what this all means is uh, even if you have a small trailer or a big trailer, expect a very hefty drop in your miles per gallon and um, electric vehicles are starting to become part of the conversation here. What I've noticed is very similar in electric vehicles where if somebody uh, has an electric vehicle, we'll say a 300 mile range, um, an electric tow vehicle as it were, and uh, they start towing a trailer behind it, they'll get about 100 miles out of it before they need to recharge. And a lot of people are really freaked out by that. But if you look at the miles per gallon drop in an internal combustion engine, it's a very similar ratio. Now, I'm not trying to go down a different rabbit hole here, which I have a propensity to do. There's, I'm not saying it's an equivalent conversation because of how long it takes to recharge a vehicle versus refuel a vehicle, how many available stations there are. It's not an equivalent conversation at this time by any means. But essentially, if you start towing, you're going to cut your miles per gallon uh, or available mile distance, whatever you want to call it, on an electric vehicle uh, into a half to a third of what you normally see. So let's say we got all that figured out. Not everybody has a place they can just store the RV when they're done driving it around or camping with it. Some people can't just park it in their backyard because they don't have space, the homeowners uh, association won't let them, whatever the case might be. Um, some people need to look at RV storage. So how much does that run? And <laughs> it varies. <laughs> I think you get the idea by now but what i'm getting at let's say it's just a basic dirt lot that you're going to pull in there's going to be a ton of trailers parked around it that might be around you know 50 bucks or something like that now often that's kind of a monthly rate so keep that in mind but let's say you're like no 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 i've got like a big fancy diesel pusher i'm not leaving that thing out in the weather where any little person can walk around and put their little hands on it well, if you want something like secure indoor heated storage, well, that might be north of $500 a month. So um, it's going to vary greatly. You're, you're really basically going to pay for what you can get or, or you, you get what you pay for. But what I was getting at there before I got myself screwed up, you get what you pay for, or if it's the end of the season and space is limited, you might have to pay whatever they're willing to demand, unfortunately. Now, quick proactive pro stip, pro stip, whatever. I don't edit my videos, I'm an idiot. Um, quick proactive pro tip on RV storage is you might want to check to see like, let's say you're like, oh crap, my kid forgot his favorite Transformer Optimus Prime Bumblebee toy in the back bunkhouse of our RV. We have to open the slides to get there at your RV storage location, are you able to, like, is there enough space? Can you get the slides open? Can you put those folding steps down? A lot of RVs have those fold down stable steps like you're about to see over here over my shoulder. Nice reveal, I'm proud of that. <laughs> um, but the, uh, my, my point here is a lot of RV storage lots, the more RVs they can pack in there, the more money they make. And a lot of people don't necessarily need to get into them. So a lot of times they're parked really close together you can't open slides, you can't open steps, sometimes you can barely open the door. Those are really important factors for you to consider and where that may actually be an important factor in what floor plan you choose on the RV. Um, it's, a, it's a factor I call road mode accessibility, but storage lot accessibility might be a very important thing for you to consider before you pull the trigger and cut the check. Now for a lot of people, um, how much it costs to, to camp in the RV per night's not an issue because a lot of people tend to boondock, but uh, still to this day, the vast majority of people do tend to park camp. So one of the other conversations I kind of want to have is how much does it cost to stay at a campground? And just like everything else, the answer is going to be, if, uh, you're going to get what you pay for. Typically, it's going to vary by the facilities available at the facility. It's got to be a better way to say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, a very let's say you're just like, listen, it's just a camp site, basically. I just pull in there. There might not even necessarily be hookups. 
typically, un unless you're staying at like a NASCAR kind of place that allows RVing and has primitive hookups, because they will they'll get all of the money from you because they can and people pay it. Um, if it's just a normal primitive pull in the lot, rent the site for the night place, that might be around 50 bucks a night, something like that. Uh, if you're looking at full hookups and the park has things like, like they got a nice pool and they have uh, like laundry facility, if they have all of the things, it might be north of 200 bucks a night. So I was kind of curious, um, how much does that kind of translate against something like um, an Airbnb or a, a hotel stay or something like that? So we did some looking and uh, last year we, we found the average Airbnb per night cost was about $216. Um, so that kind of equates to one of the nicer RV parks and you're still sleeping in someone else's bed and pooping in their toilet. <laughs> Although a lot of people will poop in the RV parks toilet too. Um, nothing wrong, just whatever works for you. I don't care, you poop where you please. It's, unless it's on my front porch, please don't do that. Um, again, um, the uh, uh, hotels though. So I've started traveling more a little bit with Bish's RV and uh, hotel nightly rates uh, for a modest place, sometimes at breakfast, sometimes doesn't, sometimes Wi-Fi, sometimes doesn't. Um, if you get a deal, you can get them for like 130 a night. Uh, a, a nicer place with nicer facilities tends to run 200 plus per night, kind of like an Airbnb. Um, the difference there is uh, you have you know, vehicle costs to consider in these equations. Like there's still fuel cost if you're towing or rental car fees. Rental car fees I've found can very quickly eclipse hotel fees. Uh, so there's there's a lot of different angles to consider on this. So if you look at a per trip basis, very often RV vacations cost less per night than uh, like a hotel or Airbnb situation by the time you factor in flights or rental cars or all that kind of stuff. Where it gets tricky, because again, I'm trying to be fair here, is that is kind of looking through a bit of a keyhole. Um, typically when you have an RV, you don't just have the two nights that you're using it to consider for expense. That's the whole point of this video. You may have things like monthly payments, insurance premiums, repairs, upkeeps, things like that. So there are, again, a lot of different total factors to consider when you're trying to figure out what is uh, the most comfortable or least expensive or happy medium between the two mama bear, baby bear, papa bear kind of vacation situation. So once again, I hope you really appreciate the, the extra time and effort that we're trying to put into this, not just to sell you the next RV, but to, to help you find your second one the first time and to help you find the one that fits your actual real world budget, not just your monthly payment budget, but like, you know, your insurance budget and all those extra kind of things. That's the, that's what we want to do for you. And, and again, this stuff, this stuff is true today, whether you buy from us or not. If you buy an RV from a private owner and finance it through your own local bank, these are important factors I think you should consider. Whether it's little things that you didn't consider, like, oh yeah, now I, I have to buy, you know, maybe some things like some wheel chocks and a, and a good sewer hose uh, all the way up to how much is my insurance going to run and how much are my license plates going to run me? I have seen people, I've been in this, I've been in it for a minute, guys, and I've seen more than one person uh, all of a sudden go, wait a minute, it's $1,500 per year for my license plate fee and renewal? And yeah, in some states it can be. And that is money that some people just didn't factor in, didn't plan for, maybe didn't have in the budget and can really put them in a pinch. But a lot of places are just gonna say, pay me, here's the keys, get it out of my driveway. We'd like to just do more and be better for you. And again, if you appreciate this today, Hit the like button on the video, subscribe if you're new with us and you appreciate the information. And uh, know that, I, I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm no authority, we're not perfect. We certainly wish we were, but we will do our best to try to, to assist you in those additional capacities. Now, if there's something I forgot to talk about or an additional insight you have or a question you have, again, leave me those comments here. And if you find this useful and you think somebody else might, I would really appreciate it if you shared this around your favorite social media group. Um, I think that this is the kind of footage that can really help somebody realize what a true RV budget is and what it is not, because it does go far deeper than just the monthly payment on the camper. So until next time, take care, stay safe, have fun, and best wishes from Bishes, everyone.